pods make a wonderful addition to bioactive enclosures in the reptile world, and they are so fascinating in of themselves that they make a great pet on their own. We recently showed you all the isopod species that we keep here at Snake Discovery, and a lot of you showed interest in us making an isopod care video. So today we're going to be showing you how to take care of isopods. Isopods are great for bioactive enclosures because they consume waste products like dying leaf litter or fecal matter from the reptiles they're living with. They also help aerate the soil and they spread nutrients throughout the entire enclosure. There's three genuses or groups of isopods that are most commonly kept in captivity. First, you've got your armadillidium, which are the shiny kind of rolly or pill buggy looking isopods. They roll up when they feel threatened. In um, our experience, these are generally kept as pets, not bioactive janitors. Mostly kept as pets because they're shinier, they're, sh they sh they're showier, and therefore they're more expensive too. The second genus is Porcelio, and these isopods are duller in coloration. They don't roll up when they're threatened. They make great janitors or a great cleanup crew for your bioactive habitat, and typically they're a little bit more on the cheaper side. And third, you've got your genus Trichorina, which are your dwarf isopods. These are great for smaller reptiles that are more likely to eat the larger isopods because they burrow under the substrate and they remain hidden most of the time. But but they still offer the same benefits as their larger counterparts. Some species of isopods may have slightly different requirements than others, but in today's video we're going to go over the general care of all isopods, so if you follow these steps you should have a healthy culture before you know it. Let's start with housing. If you're planning on putting isopods in a bioactive enclosure, you can simply just house them in there. As long as you have a moist substrate layer and leaf litter on top to hold in that moisture because they can dry out, they should be just fine and they should be very prolific as well. But if you have a reptile in there that's going to eat the isopods if they expose themselves, you might want to add a little bit thicker of a leaf layer for them to have some security underneath. But if you're planning on keeping isopods just as a pet, let's talk about what to house those in. The enclosure itself can be something as simple as a plastic container with a few holes drilled or poked into the sides of it. Alternatively, you can cut a round two inch in diameter hole on the side of the enclosure. I wouldn't recommend putting the hole on the top because you might be stacking your invertebrates, but put the hole on the side and then cover it up with some screen netting. This will not only offer ventilation just like poking holes will, but it'll also prevent gnats and other unwanted pests from getting into the culture. We like using iris bins and this is a six core iris bin. We really like the locks they have on them. They stack really well and they have nice clear sides so you can see the isopods on the inside pretty well, but you can really use any plastic container. For smaller cultures, like say you only have six isopods to begin with, you want them to be in close contact with one another to increase the chance of them breeding. So for smaller cultures, we recommend smaller plastic containers. Again, you'll need holes for ventilation, of course, but not many because you want the humidity levels to stay relatively high inside. And and then as your isopod population grows, you can of course upgrade them into larger containers. This culture in my hands is actually of zebra isopods or Armadillidium maculatum, and the culture is getting big enough now that we have to either split it in two, or I think what we're actually going to do is take this culture and put them into a 60 quart tub and they can just go crazy in here. So I mean it's up to you if you just keep splitting your cultures or if you just upgrade the whole thing into a bigger container. Either one will work though. By the way, we'll put links to all of the products that we recommend in today's video in the description below in case you need anything. Next let's talk about substrate for your isopods. You basically need a substrate that holds moisture because again you don't want them drying out. The substrate will also act as a food source based on what's inside of it. We like to use a modified version of our Snake Discovery Awesome Mix that we came up with in actually another bioactive video, which I'll link right here in case you want to check it out. But for this, we use Coconut Coir or Eco Earth, and you want this to be damp but not dripping wet. Next, we mix in sphagnum moss and leaf litter. The type of leaf that you use doesn't necessarily matter as long as it's isopod safe. It could be sea grape, it could be magnolia, it could even be oak leaves from your backyard as long as it's taken from a pesticide free area and sanitized. If you're not sure what leaves to use or how to disinfect them, we have a video all about disinfecting leaves that you can find in your backyard right here. Yeah, look, all the leaves are right back here. They're still there from that yeah. video because we, we haven't cleaned them up. We haven't cleaned them 
And we're not done disinfecting all of them. No, we're not. We have a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Next, we like to add some shed skin from snakes or lizards, if you have it. This is kind of an optional ingredient to add. Since we have so many snakes, we have lots of shed skins, and isopods love to eat those. So we mix them into our substrate as well. Interestingly enough, though, isopods don't like to eat the belly scales of snake sheds. I don't really know why, but they only like to eat the back scales from sheds. And finally, if you're adding springtails to your culture, which we would recommend, and we'll get into that a little bit later, you'll probably also want to add carbon as an egg-laying site for the springtails. After you've mixed together all of your ingredients, pour in about a two-inch layer of substrate into your container. After that, top it off by adding a layer of leaf litter to act as a food source and to hold in moisture in the substrate below. And last but not least, add a nice chunk of cork bark because isopods love crawling all over and hiding underneath cork bark. Once your containers are all set up, then you get to add the isopods, which in my opinion is the most fun part. This container is missing cork bark because we're just going to use the piece that's in here. Today we're actually splitting up a culture of ours that was given to us by our friend Kat with um, the, the sketching dragon on Facebook, if you want to check her out, she's a very talented artist. She gave us a ton of isopods and they have exploded in population in the Milano box that she sent them in. So they're getting upgraded and split today, but check this out. There are so many of these guys ready. They're all underneath this cork bark. Bam, there they are. It's just a solid sheet of isopods. She gave us oranges and Dalmatians and we, as a result, have now orange Dalmatians. These are just Porcelio Scaber color variants, but they are really, really cool. So we're going to split them up so they can each repopulate a new habitat. What's the easiest way? Just tap the cork bark. Ready? You're free! There we go. And you guys can go over here. And whenever you're splitting a culture, don't throw out the old substrate. Keep it, because there's a lot more isopods in that dirt. So we're going to yeah. split this into the, these as well. You can't really go too thick on your leaf litter layer because this acts as food, so it will diminish over time. So go crazy with it. This next part is optional, but since we have so many species of isopods, we like to do it just for our own sanity. We label the containers just with a sticker. So we're gonna put a little label on the front here. We've got our Porcelio escape. Wait, really? What? You don't capitalize the species name. You capitalize the genus, but then the species is lowercase. You know uh, that. That's why I fixed it. Oh, oh, really? You, you did that just to screw with me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I accidentally printed the first one out, and I'm like, oh, Aww. I already wasted the label, so I might as well. Emily won't let me get by with that. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> All right. Perfect. There we go. Now they're labeled. They're labeled. They have their scientific name and common name mm -hmm. underneath. You'll thank yourselves for doing it. Yes. Now let's talk about temperature and humidity for your isopods. As far as temperature goes, you can just keep them at room temperature because the 70s Fahrenheit is fine for isopods. They're actually most productive or they found to be most productive in the mid to upper 70s. So if it's kind of cold where you live, you might want to invest in a thermostated heat mat to put on the side of their container. But for most areas in the United States anyways, room temperature is going to be just fine. We keep ours in a closet because they also like living in the dark since they are nocturnal and so they're most comfortable living in the dark all the time. As far as humidity goes, if you are housing your isopods in with a reptile, if it's a tropical reptile, the humidity should be fine, so just take care of it as you would for a tropical reptile. But if you're keeping them in their own containers, you'll probably want to mist down those enclosures with dechlorinated water, of course, one to two to maybe three times weekly depending on how dry it is where you live. I like to use API's tap water dechlorinator because it's just two drops per gallon, so this little dropper is gonna go a long ways. Again, I'll put a link to everything recommended today in the description below. Just for you guys' information, I set up these bins like three, four weeks ago with this soil, and I have not needed to miss them yet. Since? Since. So it's lasted a month for it's you? It's lasted about a month with yeah. about four holes on each side. Yep. For feeding your isopods, these little cuties are detritivores, which means they eat decaying matter, whether that be decaying leaves or they'll also eat fecal matter so if you house them with a reptile they will naturally clean up the poops from your reptile which makes them really handy in bioactive enclosures but if you house them by themselves you'll of course have to provide the food for them in the form of leaf litter and there are some other foods that you can give them too. We use and recommend feeding rapashi diets. It's a powdered diet that's made for crested geckos and lichianus geckos. They make all sorts of different formulas here for various reptiles but these formulas work 
excellent for isopods and they are like an all-in-one diet for them actually. To feed them you just you can mix this with water if you want but it's easier for us just to sprinkle a little bit underneath their hide and we feed them once a week but you can feed them more frequently than that if you have a very large or hungry culture like our giant canyons are very hungry so we feed them twice a week but for the most part once a week should do it. Ideally you want to feed your isopods enough food that they can consume within about two days and then give them a couple days after that to clean up all the remnants, maybe eat some of their leaf litter to make sure that all of the food is gone and then you can feed them again. The biggest issue with feeding isopods is actually feeding them too much. So it's best to err on the side of feeding not enough than feeding a little too much because too much excess food is going to attract unwanted pests. The biggest one being fungus gnats. If there's extra food, you're probably going to have a gnat issue in your isopod culture. And if you run into this, just don't feed them as often so that the gnats run out of their food source. Or you can add springtails to the culture and the springtails will actually eat the eggs of the fungus gnats and outcompete them for food along with the isopods. So springtails, that's why we recommend adding carbon and adding springtails to your isopod culture because it'll reduce the chance of you getting those unwanted pests. Some keepers and breeders will actually feed dog food or cat food or fish food and there's all sorts of different things you can feed them but in our experience the rapashi works really well for maintaining them while also keeping a pest free environment. It's been found that dog food actually slows their growth rate and attracts insects more than other types of food out there. And fish flakes and cat food can work but it's really easy to overfeed those and then you'll get fungus gnats or other unwanted critters. So we just with Rapache, it's been working really well for us. They're not a sponsor or anything, we just really like it for isopod food. When we've used fish food in the past, it's molded a lot faster than Rapache does. It does. So if you use fish food, make sure you have springtails in there because they will eat the resulting mold, or you can just avoid mold altogether and feed something else. Other keepers will offer a chunk of cuddle bone, the same cuddle bone that you'd offer to like a parakeet or a cockatiel in captivity, and for the same purpose of just offering calcium. And although you're welcome to do that, it's not gonna hurt them at all. The Rapashi diet does have calcium in it already because it's formulated for reptile growth. So we don't offer cuddle bone because it seems like this provides enough for them. So it's just one less thing to have to buy. But that in a nutshell is how you set up and take care of isopods. At this point, it's really just misting them down as needed, feeding as needed. Oh, you fell over. There you go. Okay. He was wiggling on his back. Couldn't get up. And uh, replacing leaf litter as needed. But they are very low maintenance pets, especially since they don't even need any special lighting or heat really, depending on your room temperature. And they are really fascinating to watch explode in population. With the many species that are available in captivity nowadays, it's no wonder they're really gaining popularity and people are starting to keep them more and more as pets. And yeah, I can see them both being used in bioactive and just keeping in a container to watch mm -hmm. them grow. They're really cool animals. If you're looking for a new unique pet, definitely consider an isopod because of how unique and easy to take care of they are. We have a lot of species. We're kind of addicted. Feel free to check out the video we made uh, just earlier on the channel showing all the species we currently keep. But with that, I'd like to thank everybody for watching today's video and I hope you learned something new, maybe brought your attention to a new critter that you may not have considered to keep before. And as always, I'd like to thank our Patreon backers for their wonderful support too. And if you like today's video about taking care of isopods and you'd be interested in something similar for springtails, since we do keep and culture those too, let us know in the comments. Maybe we could do something similar for springtails. Thank you everybody for watching and joining us today and we'll see you next time.